I want you to pay particular attention to the foolish ones, okay? Five were foolish and five were prudent. Verse 3. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. You may want to underline that, okay? For You may want to underline that. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the prudent took oil in their flasks along with their lamps. Now, while the bridegroom was de was delaying, they all got drowsy and they began to sleep. But at midnight there was a shout, Behold the bridegroom! Come out to meet him! Then all those, all those virgins arose and they trimmed their lamps. But the foolish said to the prudent, Give us some of your oil for our lamps are going out. But the prudent answered, No, there will not be enough for you uh, and for us. Go instead to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they were going away to make the purchase, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went in with them to the wedding feast, and the door was shut. Later the other virgins, the foolish ones, okay, they also came saying, Lord, Lord, open up. Open up, okay, Lord, Lord, open up for us. But he answered, truly I say to you, I do not know you. Be on the alert then, for you do not know the day or the hour. Folks, this is it. I mean, you, you really don't know the day or the hour of anything that's going on in your life for sure. You don't, you don't know that, you, that you're going to be here tomorrow. I talked to, about, uh, I'm trying to remember the brother... I, don't, I can't remember whether it was Jose or Joe. Maybe Brother Joe was a couple of years ago. And some of you weren't here. Like when we were meeting out in San Jacinto. And I brought a message. And at the end of the message, I, uh, I believe that that night Pastor Andrew was out also. And I, 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 I filled in for him. And after I finished, we had a number of people that had made recommitments. And a number of people that had made commitments to the Lord. And... I can still remember it was Pastor, it was Brother Joe. Brother Joe, I'm sorry if I said Pastor. Brother Joe. And Brother Joe was standing over here on my right. And Brother Joe was a guy that, he was here at, 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 at this church. and But he wasn't one to ever come up and never to talk too much. He usually sat in the back. Never, You never heard much from him at all. And I, I, I had seen him and known him probably for three or four years. And that, that particular night, a uh, number of people, those that made first-time commitments, were here on my left. And there were, uh, I think, three people, and one of them was Brother Joe that was came up on and came up and was on my right. And uh, the message that I, that I brought it, it in some way touched him, and so he, he asked for to pray the prayer of commitment. And I prayed it, prayed that prayer with him, and I noticed his, his face was just glowing; it was different. And he walked back to his seat, and I stayed in the church and talked to a few people and did what we usually do and waited for some of the people to finish handing out food because they were handing out food that night. And uh, the last people to leave the church were my wife and my daughter and myself and the individual that was supposed to walk up the building. So we're walking over to my car, and out of the shadows comes this guy in a hoodie. Yeah, at first I didn't know who it was. And he walked up to me and I realized it was Brother Joe. And he said to me, uh, Pastor me, he says, I, I just want to shake your hand and I want to thank you. So I uh, extended my hand, sure. And so I want to thank you for the word that you brought because I, I really needed that. And I, I just needed it. I needed to hear that. And, and he had made this recommitment. I knew that God had really touched his heart. And so... Well, I didn't think anything of it. I shook his, shook his hand. God bless you. Got in my car and we went home. The next night about 10 o'clock was Christmas Eve. And about that, that time I got a text message from uh, Pastor Andrew, your pastor. And Pastor Andrew told me Pastor Joe died. I asked him, I said, what happened? My brother Joe, I'm sorry, brother Joe died. I asked him, I said, what happened? He said, uh, he had gone to a gathering, Christmas Eve ga 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 gathering with some family members on his way home or on his way to another set of family members. Apparently somebody hit him head on or a uh, drunk driver hit him or something killed him. And, and that was it. And 
you know, a lot of people I, I attended the memorial service. And a lot of people were all uh, were, were shocked and upset. Of course, the typical reaction when somebody close to you passes away. But with me, I didn't feel that. I I, I, I had no deep sadness. There was a, a a joy in my heart, and I was thinking, thank God, thank God that that man came forward and made a recommitment to the Lord because he didn't know that the next day he wouldn't be alive. He wouldn't live, live out to see the remainder of the day. If I had told Brother Joe that night that he would die and that he would never see the, 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 the entirety of the, of the next day, he probably wouldn't have believed me. Or, and how many of us, if we knew that we were going to die and that we wouldn't see tomorrow sunrise today, or that we wouldn't see the moonlight by tomorrow night, what would our reactions be? What would we, we, we do? What would you do? I mean, would you run to the family and, and, and go and call the people up that you miss the most? Or would, would you sit here like, you know, it, it didn't really matter anyway? Or I think all of us would have some reaction. But one thing for sure, folks, none of us have any guarantees. And none of us have any guarantees as to when the Lord is going to return. We don't know. Okay, for Brother Joe, the Lord returned the following day. Because even though he didn't come back physically here, Brother Joe left to be with him. Right? Am I right? You hear me? Amen? You got to amen louder than I'm preaching. Come on. I won't stand to sit here and talk, and if I don't hear anything, I'm going to stop you guys. I'll get you guys all up and have you guys run. Be like about five laps around the church here just for the heck of it to break a rut. That's the kind of guy I am. That's the kind of preacher I am. I've done it. I've preached in services where I think things are going good. I told everybody to stand up. And I had them all stand up. I said, okay, man, we're going to march around the church. We're going to sing a song. I get them going. And we'll get it to sing going, but we'll break that thing. Because I didn't come down here to let the enemy just quell his service. You know, or anybody here. You just came here for a reason, and we're going to hear God's word. Okay? But I've done that stuff before. I'm a radical guy. You know, I don't care what anybody thinks about it. I'll do it. And uh, the point that I'm trying to make here tonight is we don't know when the Lord was going to return, but we also don't know when we're going to meet the Lord or or, or when when we may go to meet Him. Now, in this story, these these five foolish virgins, they knew. They they knew they were uh, to attend a wedding and they knew that the bridegroom would be coming but they thought he was delayed. Okay, he was delayed. He was maybe, in their mind, delayed. The prudent virgins, they had oil in their flasks. They were ready. They had enough. Okay, they were prepared. They lived their life prepared for anything, at any time, for either their meeting the Lord or the Lord coming to meet them, but they were ready. Okay? That the foolish virgins, though, they knew. See, this is the point. It's not like they didn't know. They knew. So we could liken this to Christians that heard the Word of God and that knew. Okay? As opposed to people that don't know anything at all. Okay? These are people that have been under the teaching. These are people that have been in the church. These are people that have heard the Word, but for whatever reason, they decided it wasn't really that big of a deal. Things are like they've always been. Tomorrow the sun's going to rise like it always rises. It will shine like it's always shined. Uh, I'll go to bed tonight. I'll get up in the morning. I'll go do my job and do the things that I always have to do. Folks, a lot of people in the world think like that every day. And think like that even at this moment. There are people all around that are dropping dead of something. Okay? Some of heart attacks. Some of car accidents. Some of suicide. They say that there are certain numbers of, numbers of deaths from certain things that take place every second, every minute around the world. Okay? So, none of our lives are guaranteed. We can't live in a false sense of security and act like everything is hunky-dory, going to be all right. You know, look, I, I have faith, okay, for my life. I expect to be here tomorrow. I pray that I'll be here many years to come to minister the Word of God. But I don't know for sure. I don't know what God's timing is for my life. I don't know when He may take me or when He is going to return. And He could return today. He could return tomorrow. And we, so you say, well, you know, Pastor, I've heard that for a thousand years or all, all of my life. And for two thousand years, people have been waiting for the Lord. He hasn't come back yet, so I don't think He's going to come back next week. You don't know. He is going to come back. 
Okay, and the Bible describes, like I said on Sunday here in this very church, that, you know, when the Lord talks about the end time, it talks about wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes and different diverse places and all the kind of pestilence and famine and things that we're seeing that are going on now. And the critic will sit there and rough hold their arms and say, yeah, 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 but, you know, that kind of stuff has always been going on. Yeah, yeah there, we've always had wars. We've always had rumors of wars. Yes, we've had plagues before. We've had earthquakes before. We've had calamities before. But the Bible and Christ goes on to describe those as birth pangs. In other words, that right before a woman gives birth, the pangs become quicker and they become more rapid and more intense until birth comes forth, right? Okay, so you have the same events taking place, but they're happening now in the age and time that we're living in more rapidly, more intensely, more quickly. Nowadays, it used to be I, I turn on the radio or news and I'd see one event and then maybe I wouldn't see nothing for another six months. Nowadays, it seems like every time you turn on television or listen to the news or anything, there's just another thing coming on, another thing, another thing. We see COVID, we see racial unrest, we see riots in the streets, planes being burned down. We see the weather going out of control, food shortages in the store. A lot of things the Bible has prophesied we see going on, and it's not happening one month here, and then another year down the road something else happens. Okay, now we're seeing different things happening every day because the birth pains are beginning to get a lot more intense, and they're beginning to become quicker and closer and closer together because new life is coming. Okay, but see, here is the problem, okay? The foolish virgins, they knew. They knew that things that, that the birth pangs were getting more intense. They knew it was getting closer to the time that the bridegroom would open up the door and invite everyone in. They knew the time was near. They had their lamps, okay? Their lamps were with them, but they got complacent and they, let, they decided to let the oil run out or they didn't put enough oil in it. So when the door finally opened up and the moment finally came, they weren't ready. As they anticipated the moment coming, they began to realize what was happening. They said, hey, we better get out of here. First, first they said, let us have some of your oil. They wanted to get it from somebody else so that we can make it. Well, folks, you won't make it based on anybody else's relationship with God. You're not going to make it based on my relationship. You're not going to make it based on Pastor Andrew's relationship. You're not going to make it based on the relationship with somebody else in this room this evening, okay? It all depends upon you, okay? It's like I said when I brought a message here. I don't know if I brought it here or if I brought it online, but I brought a message called Choices. I think it was last Sunday I brought it here. you got to make a choice. you got to decide. If you're going to sit here tonight or any other night like a bump on a log just waiting for this service to get over so you can go back out and do whatever the heck you want to do, so you can go take a drag from a cigarette or you can go watch TV or something. You know, you're wasting your time. At least you're wasting your time listening to me. Because you've got your mind made up. But if you're open to the Lord, you're going to hear what I have to say. If you'll listen to this parable here. These were women, okay, that knew that the door was about to open. They had no question that there was a wedding feast that was about to come. But they allowed themselves to get to a place of complacency where there was no oil in their lamps. So at the very last minute when they realized, hey, you know, something is happening, maybe maybe people started mustering and coming around, they realized the wedding was about to take place or whatever, and they decided, hey, we, we, we need, we need, we're going to run out of oil. We need oil. Let, let us have some of yours. The wise person said, no, you, 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 you're not gonna, we, we can't give you any of ours. Because if we give it to you, we won't have enough ourselves. You better go get some. So they run off to the store, wherever it is that you go to get lamp. I mean, oil they can put in their lamp. Then they come back and they can't get in. It's too late. They missed it. And folks, I don't, I don't want to see anybody here miss it. I don't want to see anybody here not get in. I don't want to see people here that have been called of God to do something miss their calling and miss their opportunities because simply you lived in complacency. And look, folks, it's easy for it to happen. We go through our day. We get up in the morning. We go to work. Many of you guys have got jobs and places that you have to be and things you've got to do tomorrow. And you can get into a rut. R-U-T, a rut. You know what a rut is? You know what a rut is? 
is where you get to do the same thing over and over again until it becomes a habit. Until you, you know, you, you, it's almost, it's just, uh, I don't even know what the word is. It's, uh, it's almost like catatonic. You just do it. You just go through the motion of doing something. And you know, we can go through the motions of even going to church. We can go through the motions, folks, listen to me, of having the service. We can go through the motions of sitting here and say, okay, let the preacher do his thing, let the minister say his thing, have his word, and then let's get out of here and do whatever we got to do. And never expecting, never anticipating the bridegroom to come. Never anticipating the Holy Spirit could move in this service. There are people in this service that could be healed. I, one of my friends, a uh, pastor friend of mine, last week, last Sunday, went out to the Desert Center and set free church. And it was radical because he asked everybody to stand up and they stood up. He said, how many of you guys are sick or need to be healed or something? And most of the people in the church raised their hands. So he said, I'm not going to lay hands on you. I want you to stand up wherever you are right now and I'm going to pray for you. And they stood up and they raised their hands. Most of the church stood up. And, and listen, I kid you not, you can call the pastor of the church. You know Pastor Ryan probably. He's the new pastor over there now. Before that, it was Daniel Sostre. He was actually before that, he was another pastor. And then it was Pastor uh, Daniel. And some of you know him, okay? And, 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 and I'm, I've known all of them. But, but these guys got up in the church, men and women in the church. And listen, God began to heal, healed some of the people right there in their seats, physically healed them. A miracle took place in that service. But they stood up, they were they anticipated it, or but but they could have could have been different. See, they were like the wise virgins who had oil in their lamp that were prepared so when the Holy Spirit began to move in the service, they were able to receive. And then there were the foolish virgins that didn't have any oil in their lamp. And those are the ones that just sit here like bumps on logs, not expecting anything to happen. They could care less if something happens or if it doesn't. And some just say, quite frankly, don't believe anything is going to happen. You know you know what Jesus just said? He said, be it done according to your faith. There are some of you guys that want some answers in your life. You're looking for breakthroughs in certain things. Folks, the Lord said it, be it done according to your faith. He said, whoever comes to me, I will in no ways cast out. He said, if you draw near to me first, okay, I will draw near to you. There has to be an effort. There has to be a choice, a decision that you make that you want to be blessed by God and that you really want to walk with God, that you want to be here, that you want to serve Him. And some of you say, well, I didn't want to be here, Pastor. I wouldn't be sitting here. That's not true. I go, I, I preach in churches every Sunday all over the all over the place. And there are people in church that really don't want to be there. They're there out of habit. They're there because their parents told them to go. They're there or something because their pastor said you need to be here. And they do it out of obedience, but they are, but their but their heart isn't in it. And so consequently, they don't really care. I'm intense about this this morning, this evening. Because I believe that there are some here. And and I and I see there there are some here with, with with a lot of hunger and a desire to serve the Lord and a desire to say, look, God, whatever you have for me, I want it. But there are others that while you are here and while you believe and you know the things you've heard the gospel, like the foolish virgins that knew the bridegroom was coming. Okay, you're complacent. There's no oil in your lamp. And at the last minute when things all of a sudden begin to happen, maybe if a tragedy happens in your life, God forbid, I hope it doesn't. But what if it does? What if something happens? Are you going to be running to try to grab the oil? I've seen that. I've, been, I've experienced it in my own life. Where I was laying back and just doing my own thing, doing the things I did back in the days when I did them. Grew up in the church. I grew up in the church, so I knew the Word of God. But you know how it is that there are some people that don't take God seriously until something happens to them? I see people like that sometimes. I go in churches and I see people, when they're in trouble, all of a sudden come to the altar and kneel. But I wonder where they were sometimes the other 365 days of the year, or 364 days, when everything was going all right. Sometimes it seems to me 
that some people need to almost be in a state of continual turmoil and trouble just to get them to, to, to go to God. Or else they wouldn't even walk with God. There are some people that just, uh, they're their own worst enemies because God would rather do it the easy way. God just wants to have a conversation with you. But He wants you to be in a place where you're willing to listen, where you're willing to be obedient. And if you've made that commitment in your heart to serve the Lord, and you've come forward and you said, Lord Jesus, I ask you into my heart, then we have to ask the question here, did you really mean it? Is there oil in your lamp this evening, okay? Or have you gotten complacent because when you came forward, those words were only words. You, were, you, you felt inspired at the moment, so you came forward and you said, I, I make a decision, I make you the Lord of my life. But He hasn't been the Lord of your life. You say, He's my Savior, and you're only hoping that he, he'll, he'll save you. And for some people, they only know Christ as their Savior. And look, I don't take anything away from that. Jesus died for our sins. Thank God that we're saved. Thank God that if I die tonight, or if any of you that have made that decision die, you'll go to heaven and be with the Lord, just like I know Brother Joe is with the Lord today. I have no doubt he's with the Lord, because I was there when I prayed for him. I was there when I saw the commitment. I was there when I saw the change in his demeanor. I was there. I know that it came from his heart. But I can't speak for all of you, only you, brothers. Those of you that are here, only those of you that are listening to me within the sound of my voice and those that are listening online. And I have people online from all over the world that, that listen to my messages because I bring online messages as well as my service messages. I don't know how the quality of this one is going to be because there's no Wi-Fi or anything here, so I don't know how they come out. I'll find out, I guess, afterwards. But, what's that? We have Wi-Fi. Oh, you do? Well, I'm not connected to it, so... Yeah, it would have been... I, I wish I didn't know. Okay, well, we'll just have to hope. And then next time I'll be more prepared. No oil in my lamp. <laughs> no oil in my lamp. I didn't ask the right question when I came in. Folks, you know, really, I'm, I'm, I'm serious. You know, don't don't allow this ministry and this program that you're in to just become a status quo, just going through the motions type of thing. All right? I... I, I talk sometimes very rarely about my my sports career, which I had was cut short because of an injury. Now, I was starting. I started in a. In, I was a starter at the time. Okay, let me just put it that way. The point I'm trying to make, though, is that I remember going when I played, seeing guys in practice, and they just. They were loafing during practice. So you never would know, of course, if, what, what, what you were going to get out of them at game time. You know, and, and you, didn't, you were reluctant to put them on the field at game time because of the way they practice. You, you know, because a coach watches what you do and, and he sees how you're, how, whether you're intense about what you're doing or not. And if you're, if, you, if you're just dragging, I don't know how to say it, if you're just dragging butt, you know, in practice, and then he's not going to really want to put you in a game in a fourth down position or a third and 20 and with, with, with about 50, 57 seconds left on the clock or something and say, okay, you're my go-to wide receiver. Throw the ball to him. Half the time he can't get down the field and practice. Okay, you know, we can't live our lives that way as Christians either. We can't come to church and look at these as, as, as mere practice sessions. Every service ought to mean something to you. Every service ought to, God ought to be speaking to your heart. Yeah, every, every time you walk through the doors of this church, it ought to be like the virgins that entered into the wedding feast. The door was open, the bridegroom was there. They were ready to meet the Lord, your bridegroom. We're the bride. Okay, but He's the groom. We need to be ready, folks. Okay, I, 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 I pray, Lord, what is it that you want me to bring at this service tonight? And as I was praying, I flipped open my Bible because I was going to begin to look to, uh, at, at, at a place to read, just do some reading on my own. And when I opened it up, it opened right up to Matthew 25. I looked at it, I read it, and I thought, this is the word that God has for this church tonight. See, 
there, there's an old saying I always used to tell my wife because I, for the longest time I thought it was in the Bible. And I guess it's not in the Bible, but I'm sure if I look far enough and deep enough, I can find something very, very close to it. And it, it's this, this saying, and you've all heard it. Familiarity breeds contempt. Have you heard that before? Familiarity breeds contempt means that when you get to know somebody too well, you, get, you, get, you see them after their flesh. You see them as them, the way they are, and you don't see what's behind them in the spirit. So, you, so therefore, you don't see the, tra- the treasure that they carry. It'd be like maybe you hanging out with Pastor Andrew, because you guys work together sometimes and do things together. So you see uh, Andrew the man. But do you see the Christ in him? Or, or do, you, do you just get to know him after the flesh? We get to know each other too much after the flesh. Ah, oh, this is Brother Joe, and this is Brother Steve, and we don't, you know, this is Steve, this is Joe, and we know each other like that. But we're not seeing the Lord in, 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 in each other. And so, the mistake that we make sometimes is that we don't see the Christ in one another, we don't see the Christ in our ministers either. We hear from them so much, it's so funny because I've heard Pastor Andrew up here many, many times. Many times. I've come in here and I've brought a message not knowing what he's been talking to you guys about for a week or two. And then Pastor Andrew will get up afterwards and he say, man, he says, wasn't that a great message? He said, we have been talking to him just today and over the last few days we've been talking about the exact same thing. Isn't it amazing how the, the, the Spirit moves? And I think that's great. It's great that I can come in and be in tune with the Holy Spirit and with what maybe he's ministered to you too. But what's sad about the whole situation is that it took a stranger that you guys don't see every day to come in the door and tell you the very same thing that this guy, your pastor, has been telling you every day. But when I say it, it's cool and you hear it. But when he said it, nobody listened. That's what, what it means when the old saying is that familiarity breeds contempt. We need to treasure those that God has appointed as our ministers, as those that uh, as He's placed over us to minister to us. Treasure them not in the flesh because they're some kind of God or something like that, because we're just human beings with the same falling short issues and problems that, you know, that, that everybody else has. We're human. Okay, but God has anointed us because we have the word of the Lord. We, we live a consecrated and a committed and a dedicated life to Him. I know Pastor Andrew does, and I, I know I do. And I know there are others out there that do. And, and when they come in and they minister to you folks, give them your attention. Let them, I, I used to sit in the aisles. I remember when I was a young guy before I was in ministry. And, and I, 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 I was so... When I walked into a church, a church to me always represented a place where the presence of the Lord is. I, I, I just was that way when I was a kid. Matter of fact, one time when I was a kid, I ran away. I ran away from my home, and when I ran away, it was freezing. You hadn't been, been in Dallas. If you, if, you been, if you grew up in Dallas, Texas in the wintertime, you know what I was talking about. I don't care how far south it is. You're in the Great Plains, and the wind is coming straight from Chicago right to, <laughs> right to Dallas. It's cold. It was below zero that night, and I ran away. I'll never forget, I found this old dog, little dog laying in the grass. The dog was frozen, you know, and I put that dog up under my shirt and brought him back. And I, he wasn't dead, but he was right about there, I, and that dog lived. But I had to find a place to go for myself. So what did I do? I broke into a church. And, uh, because, and the reason I broke into the church was it, it, there were houses being built and things like that, and I could have probably slept in any one of them. I needed a place to stay. It was cold, but I broke into a church because I felt as a 12-year-old kid that God was there in that church somewhere. God, God is there. His presence is there. God is there. And it, I felt secure. And I was pretty good. I threw a bunch of uh, desks together and laid under the desk and went to sleep until the janitor, you know, came in at night and said, I saw a flashlight. Who's in here? And I realized I left muddy footprints from outside all over the church. So I bailed out of the window and got out of there, and they, to this day they don't know it was me, you know, but yeah, I guess the statute of limitations is over, so don't have to worry about Dallas cops picking me up or nothing. I didn't steal anything to track mud into the church. But folks, you know, we, 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 we take for granted God's presence. Sometimes we take for granted the church. We kick back outside, you know, around this building, and it's a building, a building that some of you are used to seeing, and 
spending a lot of time around. But this is a holy place. This is a holy place. This is where we meet and gather. And the Bible says that we're not to forsake the assembling of the saints. So we can gather together and we can worship. It discourages me when I come into church and I hear the music play playing. But I don't see anybody standing up. Or I don't see anybody singing or anybody worshiping. And I wonder, do I? is this, is this going to be a pump-up job? You know what a pump-up pump job is? A pump-up job is where the minister has to come in and pump the congregation up. I don't want to have to do that. I don't want to have to get you guys going in the flesh so that you can hear what I have to pre say when I'm preaching. When I come into this church and when Pastor Andrew comes in, whenever he comes in, you guys ought to be sky high and ready. There ought to be worship in our heart. The music should be going. You should be prepared. You know, and, and in a state of worship and, 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 and being ready. Okay, so that when the word comes, you'll be ready to receive it instead of being trying to wake up. And then finally you wake up in the middle of the service or, or, or at the end when it's all almost over. And by then all of a sudden you're alert. But, but and look, I'm not, I'm not aiming at you guys. When I say you guys, I'm speaking in general because there are other people that are listening because I have this on monitor. Okay, again, I have a lot of people that follow our ministry. Okay, so I'm speaking to everybody. When I say you, I'm not trying to single out anybody here. Okay, I'm saying in generalities because I'm speaking to the church. When I talk to the church, the church is the body of Christ. And the body of Christ is made of many, many individuals, not just the ones in this room. Okay, and we, have, we can't allow ourselves to be in a state where we're so complacent that we have to be pumped up for any, anything that pertains to God, but we're ready to go for anything that doesn't. All right, we need to take this walk in relationship serious. Because, folks, I don't, we don't want to be attending another memorial service, you know, next week. Or, or in a few days. But it's very, very possible it could happen. Because none of us have any guarantee that our heart is going to skip. We're all in one heart away from, a heartbeat away from death. We have no guarantee that none of you can tell me, you know, for sure, do you know how long you're going to live? That you're going to be here tomorrow. That you'll see the next holiday. I can't tell you that I will. Our lives are in the hands of the Lord if we're following Him. And if we're out there and we don't even know the Lord, oh God, God have mercy. Because then, say, you're an open door. The enemy can hit you and take, and take you down any time except it be it for, for God's grace. Alright, so, I hope today, whatever getting oil in your lamp might mean to you, I think each one is individuals here. No. I think you know. I think you know. There are some that when they come in and you guys have your Bible studies, some come in and take it serious. They got their notepads ready and they're writing because they want to know. There are others that come in with their notepads because they feel that's what they have to do. There are others, but they, but they don't write a thing. They're drawing pictures or they're ignoring it all together. Some are, well, they should be hearing the message and thinking about something else, somewhere else, in another place, in another time. Some are wondering, when do I get out of here? And you can see it on the expression on their faces sometimes. Now, I'm a perceptive guy, you know. Uh, I've been an investigator for 30-something years. I read faces. You know, I used to I question them. I work criminal. I work every kind of case. I've defended criminals. But I've also worked on the other side, too. And in my profession, we, you, you, can, you can read a lot by watching people. And then when you have the Holy Spirit, on top of that, you really can read a lot. Because then God is the one that's speaking to you, too. You know, so, I, 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 this was not supposed to be really a, one of those yippee, I love this message, I'm so happy, smile. You know, um, it's not that, that, I'm sorry, folks, that it's not the message I had this evening. But it's a message that's designed to get us to look inside so that we can be at the place that God wants us to be so that we're prepared. I told somebody yesterday that I was talking to that in, 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 in the walk of a Christian, okay, life is like this. Okay, You either spend it in the valley or you spend it on the mountaintop. You, you will find in your life and in the things you go through that you're either in the valley or on the mountain. When things are going good, we're all on the mountaintop. And when, when, and when those are the times we're happy and we're praising God, oh man, it feels so good to be on the mountaintop. I've been on the mountaintop. I love the mountaintop. 
I hate the valley. The valley is, 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 is the valley is hell, and I hate being in the valley. But if I'm honest with myself, I've learned more in the valley than I ever learned on the mountaintop. Because it's when we're in the valley that we learn. It's when we're in the valley and that we have to trust God. It's when we're in the, when, when we're in the valley, excuse me, that that we seek God. When we're on the mountain, we have a tendency to yippee, do whatever we want to do, praise God, give Him a few hallelujahs, and go about our business and stuff. Everything is, is hunky-dory fine. But when we're in the valley, it's the time that we're in this place where we feel that we're alone, when we're going through it. And that's the time where we need to seek God, and that's the time that God meets us. And this is when we learn who we are. And this is when we learn who He is. And this is when we learn who we are in Him. Okay? So I, I know that everyone will be there. Everyone in this room. You're going to either be on the mountain or you're going to be in the valley. Those that are on the mountain now, got bad news for you. Or maybe it's good news. You'll be in the valley sooner or later. Those of you that are in the valley now, got great news for you. You'll be on the mountain. Okay? It's not always going to be like it was today. Alright? So I pray that this message has touched you. I don't have any great uh, thing to say at the end of this. To cap it off with, you know, whatever I needed to say has been said, and it's up to you now, you know, to, to move forward. And I pray that you will. So, with every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to conclude with a prayer. Lord Jesus, I thank you so much, Lord, for the opportunity to bring this word to this congregation this evening, Lord. Father, we pray right now for Pastor Andrew, Lord, that, Lord, whatever it is that uh, afflicting his body whether he sprained something or hurt something, got a virus or whatever the case might be, we don't know. I don't know anyway. Lord, we pray that, that Lord, you touch him right now and that you heal him, that you touch his family. In Jesus' name, Lord. Father, I pray for everyone here. Well, Lord, for those of you that, and I, I ask that you not look around right now and that you, you hold your peace for a minute, okay, with every eye closed. Maybe there's somebody here and you, you, you don't know the Lord. You said the words, but I think I, I tried to say it. If I didn't say it, I'll say it now. Words are only words unless you mean them. I said it Sunday. We can say, I love you, God. I want you to come into my life and be my Lord. But if you don't mean that, and you're just saying it because you think you ought to say it, there's nothing in your life that's going to change. All right? It's like telling somebody you love them when you don't really love them. Or somebody tells you they love you and they don't really love you. It's just words. Words are only words unless we mean what we're saying. Then there may be some here and you're saying, I, I, I need to ask Christ into my life and I need to be serious about it. I need to make a right, a commitment, a choice. I need to surrender. I need to know Him not just as my Savior, which I was talking about earlier, where He saves us, but I need to know Him as my Lord. Lord means that He's Lord, not you. That He's on the throne, not you. You get off the throne and let Him get on it. It means that he's the driver of the car, the captain of the ship, and the pilot of the plane, not you. Okay, that's lordship. He He's the one that has the decision-making process in your life. He's the one that makes the decision. If you haven't come to that place and you need to ask Jesus as your Lord, okay, then I'm, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand this evening. Anybody here in that category, raise your hand. Anybody that says, I, I need him to be the Lord of my life, that you want to make a recommitment, okay, I see one hand, okay. Anybody else? And there, if there's anybody here and you need to make a first time commitment, a serious one. Now, I don't care if you said the words before. Okay, I don't want to hear that. I only care about whether you meant it and whether you mean it today. Okay, if that's you, raise your hand. If you need to make a commitment to the Lord and you, and you know it. You know it. Okay, I'm going to ask the brother that raised his hand to step up and come up. Come over here to my uh, left side, please. Or just, 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 just right here, fine. Face me. Church, I want you to extend your hands and we're going to pray. Brother, uh, you know, it's like I said, I mean, words are words unless you mean And um, none of us are too young or too old or too bad or too good, you know, to, to need Christ as our Lord and Savior. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you to repeat and pray with me. You're going to be praying to a God that you can't see. But the Bible says to whosoever will, uh, you know, let him come to the Lord. And that in no way, God will in no way cast you out, no matter what you've ever done in your life. Good, bad, ugly, you know, whatever, it doesn't matter. The Word says in Christ, we're a new creature. 
You might have done said these words before. You need to make a recommitment. It's good. I make recommitments in my life and I'm a minister. It's not because I'm out falling all over the place in sin, but I just want to get closer to God. Okay, so nobody prejudges you based on the fact that you're coming up and making a decision for the Lord. It's the most important decision you'll ever make. It's more important than who you're going to marry. It's more important than anything because it will open up the door for all the other things that will happen in your life in the days ahead. And it will determine where you spend eternity. Alright, you hear it? You understand what I'm saying, right? Okay, so what I want you to do is open your hands up as a sign of surrender to the Lord. And the rest of the church, I want you to pray this prayer loud, please. Okay, I don't want to hear you mumbling. Okay, I want to hear you. Alright, so so he's not the only one praying. <clears throat> I want you to pray with with him and with me. Okay, let's, let's, let's believe this. Are you asking the Lord uh, as Savior for the first time in your life? You're making a recommitment. Okay. So so let's get together and let's pray together. There may be some in your seat. I asked you to come up, but you didn't come up. I can't come over there and grab you and make you come up. So, But but if you know you need this prayer or you're wondering, I wonder if I should have gone up too. Number one, it's not too late to run up here because we're all family. Number two, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah come on up. All right, good. Praise God. All right, anybody else? If you feel like you need to come, just come. Okay, and, and and if you didn't come, but you stand in your seat and you think, well, I, I, I know that's me. I'm just too. I just, I just don't want to come. Well, then pray the prayer in your seat. God hears you. Okay, so let's pray together, brother. You heard what I said because I know you were paying attention because I, I watched the whole service tonight. Uh, and I know God. God, you know, I, I I just see God wanting to change your life. I mean, there's been a lot of hurt and a lot of things you've gone through, a lot of pain. You're a big guy, but you've gone through a lot of stuff. Okay, and, and, and God knows none of us are none of us are too big for God, you know. And, and uh, I've seen some pretty tough guys break down, you know. But, but God is here for you, and, and He's going to change your life if you're willing. Amen. So let's all pray. Open up your hands, close your eyes, and just pray with me, okay? Lord Jesus, everybody in the church, come on. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, I believe. I believe. That you died on the cross for my sins. For my, for my sins. That you rose from the dead on the third day. And that you're alive today. And that you hear my prayers. Lord, I know that I've sinned. I know that I've come short. And you know what all of those sins are. And that tonight, I ask that you forgive me. Of every sin that I've ever committed. The ones that I remember. And the ones that I don't. And Lord, tonight I repent. Meaning that I am willing to turn away. Now I know that I can't do everything without without your help. I can't do it by myself. But by the power of your Holy Spirit. By your grace and by your mercy, what you accomplished for me on the cross when you died for me, I know with your help that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So I accept you tonight as my Lord and as my Savior. And I can say tonight honestly. Thank God that I'm a Christian. Thank God that I'm a Christian. Thank God that I have eternal life in heaven. Thank God that I have eternal life in heaven. In Jesus' name I pray. In Jesus' name I pray. And I thank you for hearing my prayer. And I thank you for hearing my prayer. Amen. Amen. Everyone give the Lord a hand clap. Thank you, brother. What is your name? Is What's your name, brother? Miguel. Miguel. Vincent Miguel. I, I, I love it when people come up. All right. One of the things I love about the Set Free Ministries is it's such a great place to evangelize because there's always new people coming in, there's people going out, but it's an opportunity, a great opportunity. And um, I, 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 I know in my heart that there are people in this church, right now in this service, that God has called to preach the Word. I could single out, I could, I could point to at least one, I'm going to do this without pointing, so I'm going to hold my arms. Nobody feels on the spot. I can see one, two. I see at least four people 
that I know for sure that, that, that God has called into ministry. And there are more. Okay? Actually, there's five. Five. There's five that I see. That's a lot, man, in, 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 you know, in this group. And, 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 and when I, I'm talking about preaching the word, I'm talking about doing the work of an evangelist or being a pastor. Um, I think there are others here that have ministries. Uh, and, and, we'll, and God has called us all to evangelize, whether it's on a street corner to our family or, or other places or in the church. But there are, everyone here has been called to a ministry, but there are others that have been called to be on the pulpit to speak. And you will uh, come to that, and okay, it will happen for you. And I, and I, I can just imagine, I see one brother here, and, and I didn't know Pastor Andrew back in the day when he was out in the world, out in the streets. But when I see this one brother, he reminds me of what Pastor Andrew would have been like, and what he would have, what he would have looked like to me at that time. And had I looked at him at that time, I would have thought, no way. Like like we all do, because we all look at each other and we, we have this image. You know, we got an image of who's been in the gang, who's not, and who's goody two shoes and who's not. So we all got an image of, 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 of certain things, you know, and, and, and everything. But never sell yourself short. The Bible says that the callings of God are irrevocable. What that means is that the callings of God are, are without repentance. God does not repent for calling you. And so, the Bible says that what God has called, He will bring to pass in your life. You don't have to worry about what I say. The Lord will do it in your lives. Alright? So, again, let's give the Lord a hand clap this evening. Um, I, 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 I neglected to do the offering, and I believe that you guys take a Wednesday night offering. Am I, am I right, brother? Okay. So, let's, 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 let's do the offering now. Those that, uh, uh, is there an offering dish over there? Okay. It's on, the, on my left. Those that, that feel led this evening to give, let's come forward and let's give. Let me go ahead and pray that prayer. Father, I pray this evening that you bless this offering, Lord, that it be used for your glory. Lord, that it be used for your kingdom. Lord, for your ministry, for the work that you're doing here. In Jesus' name, and I thank you for it. Amen. Amen. All right, so go ahead and do that. Uh, we won't have any worship music. We'll just give those the chance that want to give. I'm going to give you a chance to go ahead and go and do that. So anybody that feels led, go ahead. And if you um, uh, decide you want to give going out the door, that's fine too. you got to go right past the offering dish on the way out, so go ahead and do it. Lord Jesus, I thank you so much, Lord, for the, the opportunity to minister here tonight. Father, I pray your blessings on everyone at the service this evening. In Jesus' name, and I thank you for it. Amen. God bless you guys. Thank you. Amen. Ah, amen. God bless you. Thank you. God bless you guys. Amen, amen. God bless you. I'm glad you came to work. I'll see you on a Sunday, son. God bless you. God bless you, brother. Amen. Hey. You may not remember me, Mom. My name is Victor. I know. I recognize you. All right. Nice to meet you. Nice to see you again. Good seeing you. Good seeing you. God bless you, brother. All right, let me go ahead and cut this off. We got all about this. God bless you, everyone. Bye-bye.